from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm very pleased to launch uh, the program this morning with a few words of welcome uh, from the library. Uh, Mark Sweeney was named Acting Deputy Librarian of Congress soon after the appointment of Carla Hayden as the new Librarian of Congress. Previously, Mark served as the Associate Librarian for Library Services. This position, in essence, is the National Librarian. He was responsible, and still is, uh, for carrying out Library Services' mission, which is to acquire organize, provide access to, maintain, secure, and preserve the Library of Congress's universal collection of over 140 million items. This vast collection contributes to the advancement in, of civilization and knowledge throughout the world, documents the history and culture of the United States, and records and supports the creativity of the American people. Mark is one of us. He hails from McGill University and has worked his way through the ranks of the library beginning in 1987, I know that was a long time ago, uh, um, in the Serial and Government Publications Division. He soon advanced to coordinator of the very important United States newspaper program and then to chief of the Humanities and Social Sciences Division of the Library of Congress and then to the director of the library's preservation program before he moved into the associate librarian position. He is a valiant advocate of the collections and it was his support in large part <clears throat> which made this symposium possible. So please welcome acting deputy librarian of Congress, Mark Sweeney. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Library's uh, Congress's Symposium, uh, imagining the extraordinary scientific illustration from the Renaissance to the digital age. Over the next two days, you will hear from experts across the humanities, the arts, and sciences discuss the different ways that creative scientific illustration has extended the reach of human understanding about the natural world. And as Mark mentioned later today, um, you'll have a, an exciting opportunity to uh, view select items from our rare book collection, um, both historical and contemporary, that intersect the, and illustrate discovery. So I, I, it's, a, it's really a remarkable um, opportunity for you. So I hope you have an opportunity to take advantage of it. So in many ways, uh, this symposium speaks to what makes the Library of Congress uh, such a unique institution. As the largest library in the world, we maintain stewardship over uh, millions of items um, in a dizzying array of topics. And with over 20 reading rooms, our expert staff um, uh, have an opportunity to make this incredibly vast collection accessible. Um, sometimes uh, it's challenging uh, to find creative ways to bring uh, our different expertise uh, into the conversation and to share the library's vast physical and intellectual resources with users. Um, imagining the extraordinary, today's program and tomorrow's, speaks to this primary mission. Inspired by library collection, this symposium brings together experts from multiple disciplines to talk about everything from the un unimaginably uh, large to the inconceivably small. Uh, I really want to thank um, and acknowledge um, the staff that put together this program today, especially the Rare Book Division, obviously, and uh, Stephanie Stilo, who played such a large part in it, as well as Mark Demination. And I want to thank our staff of our special collection, our special events office, uh, for organizing this. Um, and also, of course, the library wants to uh, thank the Gladys Krebel Delmos Foundation for their support of this symposium. Without the support, it wouldn't be possible. So it's in this spirit of inclusion and discovery that we welcome you to the nation's library. Um, I thank you for being here, and I hope you have what I, what I suspect will be a very enlightening two days. So thank you very much, and welcome to the Library of Congress. Thank you.
Hey, good morning. My name is Stephanie Stillo, and I am delighted to welcome you to Imagining the Extraordinary. The symposium has been a long time in the making for our division, so I am so pleased to be able to share it with you uh, today and those that are to come, I guess, a little bit later this afternoon. <laughs> um, I must say, you're in for quite a treat. Our speakers are truly inspired, uh, and, and we're just delighted to welcome them to the library. So before we begin, I'd like to, of course, also thank uh, the Gladys Cribble Delmas Foundation for their support. I'm sure, as many of you know, uh, keeping these events free and open to the public requires a fair amount of financial assistance, and we're very grateful to the Delmas Foundation for their generosity. Um, I'd also like to thank the Library of Congress Events Committee, particularly Kimberly Crawford and Mary Eno, for uh, helping organize this event. Uh, and lastly, thanking Helena Zinkum uh, and, of course, Mark Sweeney for supporting the Rare Books Division uh, and their vision of this program. So as I mentioned, my name is Stephanie Stillo, and I am the curator, the lucky curator, uh, of the Lessing J. Rosenwald collection in the Rare Books Division here at the library. The Rosenwald collection is an ambitious graphic arts collection with thematic concentrations and everything from the history of science to the decorative arts. Um, in many ways, the Rosenwald collection and the vision of the man who created it was the inspiration for this symposium. Lessing Rosenwald was a collector that was inspired by the history of printing and how that technology encouraged historical change. He celebrated this interest by collecting illustrated books that documented, or sometimes created, shifts in taste and intellectual tradition over the last five centuries. Now, as someone with a purely humanities background, I found Lessing's collected books on science particularly exotic. Euclid's Elements of Geometry, Vesalius's Human Dissections, Apianus's impossibly complex celestial and geometric calculators, Galileo's moon. I wanted to find a way to talk about these books, about the profound and excited dialogue that had such a massive historical impact. And I eventually realized that my interest in these books really were their images. And the ability of these images to convey meaning hundreds of years after their publication. And it was this interest that inspired this symposium. So the harbingers of historic shifts in scientific understanding were often changes in methods of image production, from wood to metal, from metal to stone, from stone to the wide-ranging methods of photomechanical and photographic production. It was these images, flawed as they may have been, that most people experienced new, heady, and exciting revelations in mathematics, physics, biology, and the cosmos. Now, in 2018, digital tools are sounding the trumpets of a new chapter in the history of scientific illustration. While Robert Hooke's engravings brought us dozens of minuscule phenomena, the point of a needle, a strand of silk, or the barbs of a stinging nettle, digital, digital visualization tools can now envision and circulate images of infinitesimal yet vast and unique bioscapes and visualize structural variations within the human genome. The speakers here today and tomorrow will discuss this long and varied history of scientific illustration, of intellectual dialogue, of radicalism and orthodoxy, of artistic and technological innovation. But within all of these talks, we find gratifyingly common questions. How do we imagine the universe and our place within it? How can we capture the wonder and the mystery of the natural world and the human body? How do very human choices in illustration processes impact public understanding? I'd like to think that this symposium is our way of celebrating this complicated history and these complicated questions. 
Over the next two days, you will hear historians talking about finding our place in the universe. Artists will address scientific convention. Biologists will talk about breakthroughs in historic illustration. And technologists will face the frontiers of cultural heritage, storytelling, and access. It's in this spirit of dialogue and discovery uh, that we warmly welcome you to Imagining the Extraordinary. Thank you. Um, I would now like to invite our colleague from the Folger Shakespeare Library, Caroline Dorisel Melis, uh, on stage to introduce our first speaker. Good morning. It is my pleasure to introduce Roger Gaskell. Gaskell is an antiquarian bookseller based in England, specializing in scientific, uh, scientific medical and technical books but this is only a part of his resume. Gaskell has also been sharing with others his vast knowledge of books and science, not only through his dealer's catalogs, but through teaching. He is an affiliate of the Department of the History of and Philosophy of Science at the University of Cambridge, where he teaches a regular seminar entitled Science in Print. He also teaches courses on illustrated scientific books at the Bodleian Library in Oxford and at Rare Book School at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. He has published widely on printing history and the bibliography of book illustrations. Recently, he built a replica of an 18th century rolling press, which is now at the University of Virginia. Gaskell is also interested in the history of libraries and in working on an edition of the library catalog of the Royal College of Physicians of London, first published in 1660. The title of Roger's talk is How Books Shaped the Universe, the Impact of the Printed Image. Please join me in welcoming Roger Gaskell. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you, uh, Stephanie, for inviting me to come and speak. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Thank you, Caroline, for that introduction. Uh, um, it's a little bit of, it feels a, rather a responsibility um, to, to be asked to go first. Um, but on the other hand, then on reflection, I thought, well, yes, but then by the end of the seminar, you'll all have forgotten what I had to say. <laughs> um, so it's not such a risk, I hope. So, um, that, well, let's, let's hope for the best. Let's hope for the best. Um, the night sky has always been a source of wonder, of mystery, and of utility. In the ancient world, it was important to map the heavens and learn the movements of the wandering stars, the sun and moon, and Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Timekeeping, planning the farming year, the calendar of religious festivals, navigation and astrological divination were motivations enough for serious scientific study of the heavens. But science has always also been motivated by curiosity, by wonder, by the beauty of the natural world. As Nicholas Copernicus puts it in the first sentences of De Revolutionibus, among the many various literary and artistic pursuits which invigorate men's minds, the strongest affection and utmost zeal should, I think, promote the studies concerned with the most beautiful objects, most deserving to be known, what indeed is more beautiful than heaven, which of course contains all things of beauty. I want to stress this aspect of scientific discovery, curiosity, wonder, aesthetics, because as well as being a driving force for scientific inquiry, it is also, to a greater extent than is sometimes appreciated, a driving force in the making of scientific books. A young person visiting a literary home cast his eyes over the thousands of books lining the walls and on the tables. He asked nervously, have you read all these books? His host's reply, I have never bought a book 
I did not intend to read. <laughs> this is the secret of publishing. You have to sell more books that are actually going to be read. In this, pictures play a major role. Pictures sell books. Historians of science sometimes forget this, and this is one of the reasons that images can get overlooked. I'm going to look at three kinds of astronomical images, which are of seminal importance to the development of astronomy, to our understanding of our place in the universe, and to our appreciation of its beauty. The images are mostly well known, but by looking at them from the point of view of their origins, the technology of their production, and their impact on the non-professional readers, I hope to give you some hints about their place in cultural history, not just the grand narrative of the development of astronomy told by intellectual historians. Three things are essential to understanding the heavens, and they all require the use of images. First, we need a map of the fixed stars. Only once their positions are known can we track the movements of the wandering stars, the strange dance of the planets as they advance in one direction and then loop back. So that's my first topic. My second topic is a geometrical model of these movements, the heliocentric system of Copernicus. And finally, I want to look at the first investigations of the heavens not with geometry, but by direct observation with the telescope, Galileo's Sidereus Nuncius of 1610. So let's start with star maps. The night sky is a confusing sight. In order to make some sense of it, it became traditional, probably in prehistoric times, to group together stars that, that suggested the shapes of animals, gods, or mythological figures. And these are the constellations. They are arbitrary groups of stars, but they provide a framework defining star positions verbally with descriptions such as the bright star in the right shoulder of Orion. More accurate positions would be provided by coordinates, but the verbal descriptions, as well as the names for specific stars, continue to be used, and constellation figures continue to be prominent features on star maps, even for professional astronomers into the 19th century and they're still important for our amateur astronomers. Constellation figures with star positions were first printed in Venice in 1482 in the mythological poem Poeticon Astronomicon attributed to the Roman historian Gaius Julius Hyginus. But the stars dotted about the constellation figures have little to do with their real positions in the sky. Albrecht Dürer's famous woodcut celestial maps of the northern and southern hemispheres, we're just looking at the northern one here, um, are the first printed maps with accurate star positions. The lettering on the map um, credits, well, actually, it's not on the map, um, but anyway, so I think it may be on the other map. But we are, the, the, the uh, contributors to the map are credited as Johannes Stabius, who was astronomer to Maximilian uh, I, who drew the coordinate grid, um, the Nuremberg astronomer Konrad Heinvogel, uh, who positioned the stars on the grid, and finally Dürer, who drew the constellation figures round the stars. The image is printed from a, large, a very large wood block, which is about 17 inches wide, and it would have been executed by a professional block cutter, not by Dürer himself. So the print is a collaboration between at least four people, and we should bear this in mind when loosely referring, it to, as Dürer, referring to it as Dürer's planisphere. The sun, moon, and planets move within a band of sky known as the zodiac, which is tilted at an angle to the Earth's equator. Here you can see the familiar constellations of the zodiac arranged anti-clockwise around the graduated circle. Dürer's constellation figures are shown from the back as if we were looking at the celestial sphere from the outside, as if looking at a celestial globe. These designs for the, for the constellation figures uh, were important models for later celestial map makers. In the corners of the print, um, you can see the, um, the, the four depictions of ancient authorities on the sky. So um, we have 
uh, the Greek poet Aratus, um, the Roman poet Manilius, um, Al Sufi, um, who is an astronomer working in Baghdad in the 10th century, um, and finally, looking suspiciously like the Mad Hatter, um, is Claudius Ptolemy. Ptolemy was of Greek, uh, Greek origin, and he wrote in Greek, um, but, because he, but he became a Roman citizen and lived in Alexandria, so this is why he's referred to on the map as Ptolemy of Egypt. Uh, Ptolemy's textbook, the Almagest, written in the second century CE, is one of the most influ influential scientific treatises of all time. Although an epitome was published in 1496, the full text was not in print until 1515, the same year as the woodcut planisphere. The Almagest contains a catalogue of fixed fixed stars and a geometrical model of the universe with the stationary Earth at the center. This, is, this model is known as the Ptolemaic system. Ptolemy arranged his catalogue of 1,022 stars in 48 constellations. Star locations within the constellations are given verbally on the left and by coordinates for longitude and latitude in degrees with a scale of brightness or magnitude from one, the brightest, to six, the faintest. These are in the table on the right. Ptolemy's constellations and star catalogue actually lasted longer than his planetary system, for while the geocentric model was replaced, although not without a struggle, by the heliocentric, sun-centred model of the, put forward by Copernicus in the 16th century, most of Ptolemy's constellations are still in use today. Although Dura's planispheres are the first printed star maps, the first set of charts in book form to show the positions of the stars relative to one another accurately is Piccolomini's De la Stelle Fisse, printed at Venice in 1540. The magnitude of each star is indicated by the use of symbols. So these maps are a graphic representation of Ptolemy's catalogue, the numerical coordinates translated into positions and the magnitudes into symbols. It was another 50 years before Giovanni Paolo Gallucci published the first star atlas to combine constellation figures with accurate star positions. So now we have all the elements of the typical star atlas, a series of maps with constellation figures, accurate star positions, and a system of coordinates. Gallucci took his star positions from the catalog printed at the end of Copernicus's De Revolutionibus of 1543. Copernicus made a few corrections to Ptolemy based on fresh observations, and he changed the coordinate system, but his catalogue is essentially Ptolemy's catalogue. The images on these two uh, small Venetian atlases, Piccolomini and Gallucci, are like the planisphere with constellation figures designed by Dürer, printed from woodblocks. Very different in appearance is the Uranometria of Johann Bayer, printed at Augsburg in 1603. Here you see the elaborate engraved title page. Um, and here is one of the maps. And this is one of the most beautiful star atlases and the first to have charts printed from copper plate engravings. It was also the most accurate to date, being based on the star positions calculated by the Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe from new and highly accurate observations. As well as using these more accurate positions um, established by the Danish astronomer, Bayer also introduced a new system of, of nomenclature. In each constellation, he gave the principal stars the letters of the Greek alphabet in descending order of magnitude. Thus, the star in Orion's left shoulder is Alpha Orionis. Being one of the brightest stars in the sky, it also has its own name, Betelgeuse. But most stars do not have individual names, and Bayer's nomenclature is important and still in use today. But above all, Bayer provided the first really accurate plates. Gallucci had shown the way by providing scales and grid lines, but his small page size and the coarseness of the woodcut illustrations meant that his star positions could not be read off the plate with any accuracy. 
Bayer's much larger plates and the finer lines of engraving allowed him to achieve a quite new level of precision. The plates are about 18 inches wide. So if you compare this with Gallucci's page, which is about seven inches wide. But Bayer's atlas is still small compared to later atlases. John Flamsteed's atlas of 1729 is almost twice as wide as Bayer's at 32 inches, and some atlases were even bigger. The plates are generally attributed to the German engraver Alexander Meyer under an early use of stipple engraving where the image is made up of small dots. This is the perfect technique for rendering the constellation figures so, they are, so that they are easy to read without interfering with the star symbols um, and their lettering. Bayer's atlas was important for practicing astronomers. We know that when Flamsteed at the Royal Greenwich Observatory made his great 3,000 star catalogue, beginning his observations in the 1670s, he used Bayer's charts to locate the naked eye stars, filling in the new telescopic stars between them. But as with most books, professional users make up only part of the market. These well-drawn and finely engraved mythological figures would have appealed to buyers of other high-end illustrated books, important for the publisher of what must have been a very expensive book to produce. So I'll leave the evolution of Star Atlas is with it here with Bayer's Atlas published in 1603, representing the sit situation just a few years before Galileo started looking at the heavens through his telescope. But before I get to Galileo, what about the wandering stars whose movements are defined with reference to the fixed stars? This diagram is one of the most famous in the history of science. It is, of course, the heliocentric it is, of course, the heliocentric model of the universe in Nicholas Copernicus' De Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres, published at Nuremberg in 1543. This is the diagram that shows that our world is not at the center of the universe, but just one among the other five known planets circling the sun. One of the advantages of the new system was that it made it possible to compute the periods and distances of the planets from the sun. The diagram shows how elegantly this works, with the planets ordered by the time each takes to orbit the sun related to its relative distance from the sun. The period of each planet is given in the legend on each circle. The outermost planet, Saturn, has a period of 30 years. Then comes Jupiter at 12 years, Mars, two years, Earth, one year, of course. And the inner planets, Venus and Mercury, with periods of nine months and 80 days. The outermost sphere is labeled Stellarum Fixarum Sphera Immobilis, the immovable sphere of the fixed stars. I want you to remember this phrase, the immovable sphere of the fixed stars. Copernicus had been working on his treatise for many years when the young Joachim Reticus arrived at the monastery in Frombork in Poland, where Copernicus was a priest. This was in 1539. This neatly written manuscript was completed two years later in 1541. It seems to be a presentation manuscript, not printer's copy, and it certainly was not the manuscript that went to the printer. A copy was made after Reticus had left Frombork and sent to him in Nuremberg. At some point, some very interesting changes were made to this famous diagram. What we are familiar with in the printed book, printed book is not what is in Copernicus's own manuscript. In the manuscript, there are eight circles. But in the woodcut, there are nine circles. An extra circle has been introduced within the sphere of the Earth with a sphere for the moon around it. Um, I'm sure you can, so, sorry. Um, so so there, there is the Earth, Telluris cum Luna, but here it's now got its own circle and a, an extra circle um, for the moon. 
Copernicus believed that the planets were carried round in solid orbs. The introduction of a circle in the Earth's sphere implies something quite different, not a solid sphere in rotation, but the Earth moving freely through space, the line in the diagram indicating an orbital path. Since Reticus oversaw the printing of De Revolutionibus in Nuremberg, or at any rate in the early stages, he presumably supplied the block cutter with a sketch to work from. In this case, he would have been responsible for introducing the circle for the Earth and the subsidiary circle for the Moon. Innumerable textbook diagrams supposedly illustrating Copernic the Copernican system follow this and show the planets positioned on the circles rather than between them. Copernicus actually thought that the planet, of the planets being carried round in solid spheres within which they had further complex movements just as in the Ptolemaic system, in the Copernican model, the planets moved in small circles called epicycles at the same time as being carried round in their spheres. This was necessary to account for their looping dance. The ambiguous woodcut in De, De Revolutionibus is responsible for the misconception that the Copernican system involved the planets moving through space along circular paths without epicycles and therefore more elegant than Ptolemy's system, which also required epicycles. In fact, orbital paths without epicycles were not introduced until later in the century by Johannes Kepler. Then something curious happens outside the sphere of the Earth. The next ring is empty, so this ring is empty, and the, all the lettering has now been shifted to the outside of the lines compared to how it was in the manuscript. So the lettering for Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are now sitting on the lines, and so by analogy with the Earth's path, they seem also to indicate not solid spheres but orbital paths. But shifting the lettering to the outside of the circles has another highly significant effect. The sphere of the fixed stars no longer has any boundary. This, I think, gave a hint for another significant reinterpretation of Copernicus. In 1576, a startlingly new picture of the universe was printed. Both in this diagram and in his text, Thomas Diggs states emphatically that the universe is infinite, he also shows the planets conf confined. He also shows the planets confined in their spheres as Copernicus had intended. So, he, so he's correcting the Copernican diagram. He's correcting De Revolutionibus by carefully reading the text. So, in fact, this is the first really accurate diagram of what Copernicus was getting at, apart from the the, the fixed, fixed stars. Digg's major intervention concerns his interpretation of what Copernicus says about the size of the universe and the possibility of an infinite universe. This woodcut appears in an appendix to a new edition of the popular almanac by Thomas Digg's father, Leonard, called A Prognostication Everlasting, which was based on the traditional Ptolemaic Earth-centered universe. Thomas reprints his father's work with a few corrections and adds, a perfect description of the celestial orbs according to the most ancient doctrine of, Pythag of the Pythagoreans, lately revived by Copernicus and by geometrical demonstrations approved. It's a free translation with some additions of parts of the first book of De Revolutionibus. It's the first English account of, of the Copernican system and the first publication of the heliocentric diagram in Britain but with the hugely significant addition of an infinity of stars beyond the solar system. This was before Giordano Bruno's more metaphysical speculations on the infinite universe, which was possibly influenced by Diggs and was published eight years later, also in London in 1584. Diggs' work has recently been discussed by David Wooten in his well-received history of, of the scientific revolution, The Invention of Science. According to Wooten, and I quote, the illustration spreads over two pages and it appears to have been added as an afterthought as the book went through the press. 
Binders were never quite sure what to do with it, to incorporate it as a fold-out page or as a two-page spread. As you can see, the text of the first part ends finis. So this is the end of, of, of Leonard Diggs's part of the book. But the, um, the image has folio 43 printed in the upper right corner of the sheet. And the last page of the first part of the text is obviously folio, folio 42. So it's clearly intended to be bound here as an upright foldout, as a frontispiece and a kind of title page to Thomas Digg's perfect description of the celestial orbs. But there's no other title page to this part of the book. Further bibliographical analysis shows that it cannot possibly be an afterthought. It is an integral part of the book, of the book printed along with the text. I mention this as a cautionary note. Paying a little attention to the physical object might have saved Wooten from his condescending suggestion that the illustration was an afterthought, and by implication of less importance than the text. On the contrary, it was carefully planned from the beginning. The woodcut would have, been an would have been expensive to make, and printing it complicated the production process. So let's look at it more closely. The lettering with, um, within the outer ring states that this orb of stars fixed indefinitely up extendeth itself in altitude spherically and therefore immovable. It is garnished with perpetual shining glorious lights, innumerable, far excelling our sun, both in quantity and quality. The striking thing about this diagram, and the reason it is so often reproduced, is that the fixed stars are not in, a, in the outer sphere, which only has text in it, but are outside it and at variable distances from the sun. In the text, Diggs explains that the stars are fainter the farther out they are, until our sight is no longer sharp enough to distinguish them, and the greatest number are, as he says, by reason of their wonderful distance, invisible unto us. I ask you to remember the label on the outermost sphere in the Copernican diagram, the immovable sphere of the fixed stars. A central tenet of the Copernican system is that the Earth is not stationary, but spins on its ax axis every 24 hours. So when we see the heavens wheeling over our heads, they are not really moving. We are. Copernicus could not detect any parallax in the fixed stars, no measurable difference in the angles between the stars wherever we are on our annual journey round the sun. So the sphere of the fixed stars must be at an immense distance from the planetary spheres. Copernicus only says that this distance appears to be infinite, appears to be infinite, compared with the tiny dot of the Earth. Whether the universe outside the fixed stars is infinite is something that he, Copernicus, said should be left to the natural philosophers. And historians have debated whether Copernicus really believed in an infinite universe. But the crucial thing is that even if he did, he still meant that the fixed stars are contained in a spherical shell. The astonishing new idea put forward by Diggs in his text and in the image is that there is no boundary to the fixed stars. They extend out to infinity, the majority so far off that they are invisible to us. Another early English Copernican, William Gilbert, well known for his pioneering work on magnetism, wrote a work on cosmology sometime in the 1580s but it was not published until after his death. This is De Mundo Nostro Sublunari, in which Gilbert makes clear that he believes that the universe is infinite and that the stars and planets move through a vacuum. Gilbert distinguished between light-giving stars and reflecting bodies, and it has been suggested that this image demonstrates Gilbert's belief in multiple solar systems. The larger stars might indicate suns and the smaller stars, planets. But we have here to be even more careful about taking the illustration to be an expression of the author's ideas. The woodcut is, is an accurate representation of the diagram in the manuscript, which survives in the British Library. But it was compiled from Gilbert's papers sometime after his death in 1603. 
We don't know if the diagram is derived from something that Gilbert drew or if it was introduced by his younger half-brother when he assembled the text. Whatever the source of the diagram, it is clearly influenced by Diggs. And I think that the larger stars in this woodcut simply represent brighter stars and would refer, therefore refer back to the tradition begun by Piccolomini in 1540, as we saw earlier, where the different symbols represent different magnitudes. Having looked at the maps of the heavens up to Bayer's beautiful atlas of 1603, and then the, mo the movement of the planets against the background of the fixed stars, for the last part of my talk, I want to look at the book that put an end to speculation, if not to controversy. In the words of the great Galileo scholar Albert van Helden, after the publication of Galileo Sidera's Nuncius in 1610, the universe and the way in which it was studied would never be the same. The universe would never be the same. Sidera's Nuncius, the starry messenger, was decisive because instead of debating with ancient authority and using complex geometrical models, Galileo used visual arguments. He shows us what he observed for the first time with, his, with the telescope and argues that this leads inevitably to conclusions about the nature of the universe. Diggs's speculation that the more distant stars were invisible to the naked eye was excitedly confirmed when Galileo first focused his telescope on the fixed stars. Referring to the classification of the stars introduced by Ptolemy, remember the first magnitude is the brightest and the Six is the faintest. Galileo writes, with the glass, you will detect below the stars of the sixth magnitude such a crowd of others that escape natural sight that it is hardly believable, for you may see more than six further gradations of magnitude. Here, Galileo shows part of the constellation of Orion on the left and the Pleiades on the right. The large open stars are the ancient stars, that is, the naked eye stars. The new stars are solid black, of different sizes to indicate different magnitudes. The woodcut on the left shows the three naked eye stars in Orion's belt. I'm sure you can see that. Um, so here's the belt, and then there are six in, the, in Orion's sword. Surrounding them are 80 more stars revealed by the telescope and never seen before. It's one of the many puzzles about this book that the woodcut is too big for the page. In this copy, the star on the right has almost fallen into the gutter. I'm not using fanciful language here. The gutter is the bibliographer's term for the inner margins of the book. Even in Galileo's original drawing, the page barely contains the stars. The printed woodcut uh, follows the finished drawing very closely and the dimensions are identical. In many copies, one or more of the stars at the top of the page and one on the left are cropped or trimmed away by the binder. One of the reasons that the Library of Congress's untrimmed copy, which is on show in the exhibition, is so important. It might be argued that this is a rhetorical device. The unbounded page becomes a metaphor for the boundless, infinite universe. Whether or not this was in Galileo's mind, it could well have had this resonance for contemporary readers as it does for us today. Now, the discovery of the vast numbers of stars invisible to the naked eye is only one of the discoveries reported in Galileo's book. What made Galileo particularly anxious to rush his book into print was his discovery of the satellites of Jupiter, which he dedicated to Cosimo de' Medici, calling them the Medician stars. The satellites of Jupiter helped to confirm the Copernican theory by showing that the Earth was not unique in the solar system in having satellites or moons. 
The, <coughs> excuse me, the Sidereus Nuncius is a news book, and Galileo could easily have been scooped. Third of the great revolutions in the book, which actually comes first, is Galileo's discovery of mountains on the moon. This contradicted Aristotelian orthodoxy that everything in the heavens must be perfect and unchanging and the moon a perfect sphere. The impact of the printed images is remarkable. L nothing like this in terms of either the medium or the message had been seen before. There are four images, one of which is repeated. In the first image, the new moon is shown on the fourth or fifth day. The terminator, the division between light and dark, is not a smooth curved line as seen with the naked eye, um, it, but the telescope reveals it to be jagged, uneven, a sin and a sinuous curve. Several white spots are seen in the dark areas and dark spots in the bright areas. The white spots gradually enlarge and merge with the bright areas of the moon, while more appear in the dark part. Galileo explains this by analogy with terrestrial geography. Only the peaks of mountains are illuminated at sunrise and the valleys are in shadow. But the dark shadows diminish as the sun climbs higher until the whole valley is flooded with light. The first and third quarters are shown here um, to illustrate how the shadows cast by the sun define the huge mountains around the large area in the upper part of the moon. Unlike the mountains, the, um, the appearance of the large ancient spots on the moon, the ones seen with the naked eye, do not change as the angle of illumination changes. They might, following the opinion of Pythagoras, be seas. Here the second image is repeated and a fourth is added, continuing the visual evidence for the vast mountain range in the upper area. <clears throat> now, these are etchings, intaglio plates, printed in a separate operation from the text. The text was printed first by the letterpress printer using a common press on the left in this contemporary image, leaving blank spaces for the illustrations. The etchings were then printed into these spaces in a separate workshop using the rolling press. Um, which is a quite a different kind of press, which is shown on the right. And as the caption to this plate explains, this is a press for printing images from incised copper plates. The plates are rather clumsily printed with a significant amount of surface tone. And there are ink deposits on the plate ed edges, which have not been well cleaned before being put to the rolling press. So this... Um, so this is sort of surface tone, which hasn't been cleared off, and then there's some extra ink deposits along, along here. The lines and dots of the image are created by etching, identified by the fluidity of the lines and the blunt ends of the strokes viewed under magnification. The circular outline seems to have been made with a pair of compasses, but rather carelessly, um, as the lines are doubled up in places. There is little conventional syntax of uh, curved lines or cross hatching, which we would expect at this period. Both the etching and the printing of the plates seems amateurish in comparison with what one would expect of etching for this period. Uh, for example, in the contemporary, by the contemporary Venetian etcher, Odoardo, Odoardo Fialetti. Original watercolour drawings by Galileo survive, but they're not the direct originals for the etchings. Six moons are shown here, and a seventh is on another half of the sheet, numbered eight. These finished drawings are presumably based on earlier sketches, as the field of view of Galileo's telescope could only take in at most half of the moon's surface. Galileo could never have seen the whole disk of the moon looking like this. The four etchings in the printed book are even further from what was visible through the telescope on any one night. In the text, Galileo describes observations of the surface of the moon over several nights, but refers in each case to the first image. 
The etching is a composite combining geographical features of the lunar surface only visible on different nights. Even more extreme is the appearance of the large round crater in the lower half of the moon's, um, of the moon's disk. The crater on these two images is derived from earlier sketches <clears throat> of the crater alone and drawn to a larger scale. These are, sub these are subsidiary figures. Overlaying them on the main image creates a completely erroneous view of the moon. The crater is nowhere near this big, but, re but representing it in this way allows Galileo to argue his point without introducing another etching. <clears throat> the four etchings are synthetic images, making a visual argument in support of Galileo's contention that the changing appearance of the moon's surface as it waxes and wanes are due to the shadows cast by its physical features, huge mountains, valleys, and seas like those on Earth. When the Sideris Nuncius was published in 1610, the dominant form of book illustration was engraving, not etching with an established syntax for representing the effects of light on uneven surfaces. The Sideris Nuncius was the messenger bringing the news of Galileo's discoveries to the public. The etchings certainly give a sense of immediacy to the printed pages than the stiffer style of engraving would have done, which the, the stiffer style of engraving would not have done. The full scientific report was intended to follow. Writing to Cosimo de' Medici in the summer of 1611, Galileo informed his patron, I want to draw the phases of the moon for a whole period with the utmost diligence and imitate them in minute detail, and I want to have them engraved in copper by an excellent artist. Galileo was well aware that his images were not accurate maps of the lunar surface, and the etchings were somewhat informal for a scientific treatise. For that, he needed a new series of observations and engravings made by a professional printmaker. In the event, Galileo next turned his attention to sunspots, and it was Johannes Hevelius who, in 1647, published the first accurate engravings of the moon's surface for a full lunation in a spectacular series of 20 engravings in an imposing folio. But that's another story. So where does Galileo leave us in 1610? In 1603, the positions of the fixed stars had been accurately mapped by Johann Bayer. His beautiful atlas was on the library tables of the wealthy, and it was also later used by astronomers like John Flamsteed. As Thomas Diggs had realized, and Galileo confirmed with the telescope, there were far more star stars than Bayer had recorded. At greater and greater distances, stars are fainter and fainter. There must, as Diggs pointed out, be many stars which are simply too faint for us to see. Not only was the Earth no longer the center of the universe, but the universe itself had no end. The Earth, as Copernicus had explained, was just another planet. There are other planets like ours, other solar systems, men in the moon, extraterrestrial life. Such speculations were not long in coming. John Wilkins' Discovery of a World in the Moon, published in 1638, is an account of the new world, the new world view of Copernicus, Kepler, and Galileo. The Galileo mo Galilean moon has Earth-like features, and says Wilkins on the title page, "'Tis probable there may be another habitable world in that planet." The image is a woodcut with type set below it. A very a very rare, it's a very rare case of a title page designed as a double page spread. This is a very self-conscious combination of text and image. Again, it's no afterthought. The makers of this book put a lot of care into this and we need to take it seriously. The woodcut is reproduced as the top half of the engraved title page of the second enlarged edition of Wilkins' book. Um, Below this, the figures of Galileo on the left is copied from the Latin edition of Galileo's dialogue, uh, dialogue on the two world systems, where the other figures are Aristotle and Ptolemy. Copernicus, uncertain and perplexed, says, 
well, what if it is true? And Galileo, gesturing to the superior vision of the eagle, which his telescope had given him, says, here are his eyes. And Kepler says, and his wings, hinting that to find out more, we should fly to the moon, referring to his science fiction dream, Somnium, written in 1608 and published in 1634, a few years before Wilkins' discovery. The scroll on which the title is written is a map of the moon's surface. The top half of the engraving, elaborating on the woodcut in the first edition, is a wonderful example of how much information can be packed into a small space. And this is only possible with the fine lines of engraving, rather than the coarser lines of woodcut. What you see here on the screen is less than four inches wide. Here are the stars of different magnitudes taken from digs, but in the planetary system, but in the planetary system, the planets are on orbital paths in space, not confined to solid spheres. The Earth is personified as Ceres, the goddess of agriculture. With her, um, with, there she is with her sickle and her sheaf of corn. She's yearning for her daughter, Proserpina, personified as the moon. Combining, combined with this is a lesson in astronomy, demonstrating how the planets are lit by the sun and the phases of the moon are shown below. <clears throat> this is a serious scientific work, not mere science fiction, like William Godwin's um, Man in the Moon, which was published in the same year. So in conclusion, I hope that I have, shown, I have convinced you that the printed book shaped the universe. The production of printed images was not unproblematic, but the efforts made by authors, editors, and publishers to put ideas into pictorial form shows how important these images were. Copernicus's De Revolutionibus is a handsomely produced folio, a worthy companion to books of theology or philosophy. Engraving allowed Bayer to produce more accurate charts and provide the opportunity to present multiple layers of allegory and science in a book for both connoisseurs and astronomers. High quality printing and <clears throat> illustration helped to sell these books and not just to professional scientists. This in turn helped to bring the meaning of the scientific findings to a wide audience. Images were necessary for professional readers, perhaps even more so for book owners who were not going to follow the science too closely. It is said that we live in a visual age, and I wonder if images are as significant to scientific discovery and communication as they once were. I'm looking forward to the lectures on modern science in this symposium to learn more. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Lila Vekerdi, and I am from the Smithsonian Libraries, here to introduce Pedro Raposo. Pedro Raposo is curator of the Adler Webster Institute for the History of Astronomy. He holds a doctorate in the history of science from the University of Oxford. He has published on topics such as the history and heritage of 19th century astronomy, the history of colonial observatories, and the circulation of knowledge in 18th century Europe. Raposo is responsible for the use and research of the Adler Planetarium's varied collections of historic scientific instruments, rare books, and works on paper. Some time ago, I asked Dr. Raposo when and why he decided to work with heavenly objects. He answered, at the age of 18, that is a long, long time ago, I founded a local astronomy club with some friends 
We often went to schools, associations, festivities to show the moon and other celestial objects through, teles through a telescope to attendees of all ages and walks of life. I always like to talk about history topics in these events, such as Galileo, astronomy and navigation in the Age of Discoveries, the discovery of the Uranus. I irrevocably became fascinated with astronomy around 1993, when there was a lot of hype about the Perseides meteor shower. Even though the shower was not, at least to the eyes, as a beginner observer in a factory town in the suburbs of Lisbon, as spectacular as the media promised it to be, it made me look up and want to identify the constellations and learn more about astronomy in general. Dr. Raposo's talk is about fathoming the heavens, size, scale, and depth in astronomical illustrations. Dr. Raposo. Good morning. I would like to begin by uh, to, to thank, uh, well, Lila Vecchetti for this lovely introduction, uh, revealing my past and my uh, own romance with astronomy. And I would also like to thank the organizers of this workshop for the invitation to be here. I'm really thrilled to be here, among other reasons, because I am a historian of science, specialized in the history, with focus in the history of astronomy, who finds himself working in an institution which for some 88 years now has been precisely in the business of scientific visualization, the other planetarium in Chicago, which was the first optical projection planetarium uh, in America. And through our sky shows, through our exhibitions, uh, through our, for example, Space Visualization Laboratory, which is a part of the Adler where you can go to daily and see some really um, impressive images and visualizations and talk to an expert, we've been trying precisely to visualize and to present the heavens before our audiences. I would like to share a brief story with you, a recent story. One of these is I was at uh, one of our neighbors, the Field Museum, which is in the museum campus in Chicago, and I met one of the volunteers at the Field Museum, a lady, uh, who, when I told her that I work, I was a curator at the Adler Planetarium, she told me that, oh, I don't really like to go to the Adler. Well, not a great beginning of conversation, but then, uh, so why is that? And she told me, well, because it really reminds me that the universe is immense. The universe is overwhelming and it makes me feel small. Well, and I felt relieved. Okay, we are doing our job properly then, because all of that is true. But in fact, uh, imagining more than imagining the, the arrangements of the spheres in the sky, the arrangements of the planets, of the orbits, uh, or imagining the surfaces of other bodies, thinking of the scale, the size, and thinking of space precisely as space and our place in it, it's in fact a great challenge. And what I would like to uh, do over the next 30 minutes or so is to take you in a journey through uh, the Adler Planetarium collections uh, to, to see um, some examples, and to show you some examples of how this three-dimensional thinking in astronomy and in cosmology expressed itself through the centuries. In the Middle Ages, one of the most important tools to teach astronomy uh, was the Armillary Sphere, which, which appears here in this uh, um, lovely manuscript fragment. The armillary sphere represents the central hearth, as according to Aristotelian Ptolemaic uh, universe, surrounded by the major astronomical circles. It is not exactly a physical model of the universe, but more of a tool that helps think of the centrality of the earth and of, of those astronomical circles, which are fundamental to understand every other motion and phenomenon in the sky as projected in the celestial sphere. But nonetheless, it did convey this strong impression of 
the place of the earth in the arrangement and in the order of things. In this frontispiece by the French mathematician Laurence Finet, uh, uh, Laurence Finet appears holding an astrolabe in conversation with the muse Urania. And looked at above him, we see a complex diagram in which the Hermillary sphere is combined with a typical diagram of the arrangement of the orbs. Precisely to give this, convey this idea that uh, the arrangement of the orbs and the sphere all converge in this idea of how things are arranged in the cosmos and how motions can be uh, understood from, uh, from the idea of these uh, relative arrangements. Uh, Hermillary spheres sometimes were taken to high degrees of complexity. In this example uh, from 1562, by the prominent instrument maker, Walter Zarsenius, the Hermillary sphere includes uh, a substantial number of circles. It's a very intricate arrangement that has the purpose of simulate different motions of the heavens and explain different motions uh, uh, in the sky. You see that it's a very elaborate piece, and even the fact that it survives and it reaches this suggests that, well, made by a prominent maker in such an exquisite piece, more than a teaching tool or more than a model of the universe was also a symbol of intellectual sophistication and we might guess maybe of status of the owner having the universe and an object that reproduced its motions basically at hand. Some paper engineering was also used to try to make sense of the complex, the complexity of uh, planetary orbits uh, as presented in the works of Ptolemy and then has uh, uh, explained through the works of other authors such as Jörg Purbach. Here we see a manuscript, a vellum manuscript uh, with Volvels illustrating Purbach's famous Theorica Nova Planetarum, the new theory, theories of the planets, which was a work that had a wider uh, circulation and was widely used as a, a textbook uh, in the 15th and 16th centuries. Uh, and what you see on your left here so this is essentially a paper device with movable parts which uh, would convey to the user a better sense of how the intricate arrangement of circles and circular motions that we heard of in the first talk actually could explain and help predict the, the position of a planet in the sky. But imagining the specific arrangement for each planet uh, was actually quite Complicate. Here we see this illustration, which is almost daunting, really, where you see an attempt of representing, uh, well, on an image, on a bi-dimensional image, uh, the arrangements in space of the specific uh, arrangement of orbs and circles for each planet. Some instrument makers undertook the challenge of turning this into a natural three-dimensional object. And what you're going to see now in the image on your right, it's very much resembling of an Hermillary sphere, but it's actually much more than that. While the Hermillary sphere was pretty much just the basic representation of the central Earth and the major astronomical circles, that object uh, on the right, made by Girolamo della Volpare in Florence, 1582, it's actually a material real realization of the Ptolemaic theory for the orbit of Mercury. And you see all the, the, the arrangement of circles and how complex that was. So these were all techniques and ideas that helped visualize the complex arrangement of spheres that was used to, uh, uh, was necessary to explain the celestial motions according to Ptolemy um, and the theories of Ptolemy. Of course that with the advent of the telescope and of, um, telescopic observation, and uh, we've heard already, uh, we, we, we've heard substantially about it in the first talk. Of course, that the use of visual evidence and the use, the use of visual arguments uh, to convey telescope discoveries and to inform debates about what these findings really meant in terms of the order of things, of course, brings about new challenges and opens new pathways for visualization for representation. And it's not only the telescope, I think, and it's not only the printed image that will help create a really 
a whole new image of the universe. There was already a background to accommodate all of these new visual evidence. The developments in perspective throughout the Renaissance, surveying new instruments to measure, uh, the extensive mapping now extending to the whole world and defying uh, old geographical theories, and also the development of the mapping of the heavens, which is eloquently represented on your right, together with the very mapping of the Earth in this image from the famous Andreas Solaris' atlas, Harmonia Macrocosmica. All of this provides a background in which visualization of the universe of its, and, and of the celestial objects will, will reach new heights. The old diagrams showing the arrangements of the orbs will still be widely used, and they, they are still very helpful to help situate uh, and to illustrate the different arrangements that are central to the debates of the mid-17th century. So here you see Ptolemy here, this is the frontispiece of uh, Giovanni Battista Riccioli's Alma Chestum Novum from 1651. And what we see here is pretty much a visual synthesis of mid-17th mid century astronomy. You have here, uh, here you have Ptolemy basically assuming that he was wrong and his system here is pretty much on the corner. And you see that Astraea, or what seems to be some kind of crossing between Astraea, the goddess of justice, and Urania, uh, the muse of astronomy, she is weighing two competing systems, the system of Copernicus and Riccioli's own version of the system of Tycho Brahe, whose basic principle is that you let the Earth stay at the center, but you put the sun orbiting the Earth, and then you can leave some planets orbiting the sun, and in the case of Riccioli's own system, two planets still orbit the Earth. And, and the trick was that with a model like this, you could still explain and accommodate things that you observe with the telescope, such as, for example, the phases of uh, Venus and Mercury. Uh, so there was no decisive argument besides the issue of stellar parallax, which was impossible to measure at this point in history, and it, that was already mentioned in the first talk, uh, but there was no decisive proof yet. But what's really fascinating here is that if you look to the upper corners of the, um, of the frontispiece, you see the planets represented with features that could be already observed with a telescope. Note, for example, the bands in Jupiter and the satellites of Jupiter around it. And here, a planet that is very familiar and recognizable, Saturn with its rings. And Saturn was precisely one of the bodies that posed one of the major challenges in terms of visualization. The varying appearances of Saturn as seen through a telescope through time was very intriguing. So for decades, since Galileo first observed it with a telescope and uh, throughout the 1620s and 1630s, it was very intriguing to see Saturn showing sometimes it had the appearance, uh, it seemed that it had two satellites. Sometimes you could see what uh, astronomers at the time called hanses or handles. But it was difficult to figure out what this really was. It was Christian Huygens, the author of the book in which this uh, illustration appears, a book called Systema Saturnium, published in 1659, that came up with a consistent explanation. Uh, he used good telescopes that he built himself, which are now some of the, those telescopes are now in um, the Burhava Museum in Leiden in the Netherlands. Uh, but he also made analogies between the Earth-Moon system, he, he also discovered the first satellite of Saturn, Titan, uh, and he also used some principles from uh, the mechanistic philosophy of René Descartes. So using all of this, but above all, trying to figure out uh, uh, the relative positions of the Earth and Saturn uh, in the sky, and imagining that Saturn as a ring, he comes up with what is basically the correct explanation in this very striking illustration. So what you see here, so you have the sun at the center, the Earth, and then you have Saturn with its ring, and what the outer ring of images actually shows to you is how Saturn, when 
seen from the Earth with a telescope in a certain position and a certain relative arrangement, what is the impression that it produces in the telescope. And this image is quite remarkable because it's not just about explaining the different positions of the celestial bodies in the sky, but also an appeal to reposition the observer. So imagine what the perspective of the observer is and what the relative disposition of bodies in space are. And so this is really remarkable, and this, this is really, a, a, to, to, to a great extent, uh, it's a turning point in the way of visualizing things in space. Throughout the 18th century, these objects, the ORIs, mechanical models of the solar system, uh, in which you have, well, a, rep a visual mechanical representation of the Copernican and now, of course, of the Newtonian view of the universe, of the planets in their orbits around the sun, uh, ORIs were extremely important uh, in showing not just the arrangement of the planets, but also showing the order of the celestial motions in the sky. And there's a rich iconography about the Ori. This is probably one of the most striking images of the Ori, uh, the famous painting by Joseph Wright here, um, which appears here in, a, in an engraving. Uh, and you can see uh, basically children and one philosopher in the audience around the Ori uh, having this lively image of things moving in space. Uh, the Newtonian order of the universe, which also carried a metaphor of a moral order of the harmony of things, the harmony of the heavens, which was the same kind of moral harmony that we were supposed to look for in our lives, perhaps most of the times unsuccessfully, but still, still a powerful metaphor. And even in the 19th century, uh, when the Ori now competed with many other technologies of visualization, the idea of the Ori as something that provides a sort of a key to the true arrangements and motions of planets in the sky is still very strong. Here on the left, you see a, a, a plate from Smith's Illustrated Astronomy, a sort of a visual textbook in astronomy that was produced, there were several editions, uh, and it, I suppose it must have been widely used in schools in the US. And see, look here, the teacher is pointing at a diagram, a flat diagram of the orbits of the planets, uh, and here, Apparently another teacher is pointing at Saturn in a model, and there's a figure here which, of course, very dutifully we imagine is putting, cranking the Ori and putting it in motion. Precisely so that you can make this connection between the motions in the model and the actual motions in the sky. And as, uh, pardon. And as this striking image shows to you, the, the, the image on the right shows you, you see Urania taking a young lady who's looking at the Ori, and she's taking her up to the heavens, so the Ori is, the very key to the arrangements and the order of the planets. And the Ori was certainly uh, one of the ancestors of my own institution, the Adult Planetarium. Here we can see on the left, you see the first model of a projection planetarium uh, from 1925, uh, made by the Carl Zeiss company. And there you can see model number two, which was the projector that was set up at the Adult Planetarium in 1930 and which, again, was the first of its kind in America. It's important to remember that even though originally the planetarium, the planetarium projector was meant to reproduce what you can actually see in the sky outdoors, in the dome. Basically, it brought the heavens indoors. But in the origins of the Ori was the intention to create a connection as an experience between what you see in the actual sky and what the actual arrangement of the planets in space are. So the concept of the projection planetarium was originally developed intended as a counterpart to a Copernican Ori. So, and the projector, the planetarium projector was originally called the Ptolemaic planetarium, precisely because it brings us back to the geocentric perspective. And so the very idea in the beginning was to create this connection between that geocentric perspective and the actual arrangement of the orbits of, of the planets in the sky. And you see that in this Copernican planetarium, you have a moving platform. And there's a gentleman here looking through some kind of periscope and is looking at the Ori in the ceiling. And supposedly what he's seeing in through the periscope is how the planets will, would appear in profile in the actual sky. Now, one of the things that 
planetarians and all of these models could not convey efficiently was the idea of the true size, the true dimensions of both the planets and their orbits. Uh, and this, this has always been a very important question. So uh, in, in the 17th century, debates about the sizes of stars, for example, were extremely important in uh, discussions of, about the actual cosmological arrangement. Was Tycho right? Was uh, Copernicus right? And the sizes of the stars, together with the debates about being possible or not to determine the parallax of stars, this was extremely important in the uh, cosmological debates of the periods. Here we see, going back to um, Andrea Solaris's Harmonia Macrocosmica, here we have, again, a very striking illustration, uh, which pretty much, I won't dare say it was the first of its kind, but sets up a visual convention that will be extensively used in the following centers to show relative sizes and dimensions of celestial bodies. So basically what this image does is to superimpose in, in a single representation bodies of different sizes as they were derived on the basis of Ptolemy's theory. So basically you have the moon here, you have a scale here which is marking, uh, so, sorry, you have the earth here, so this is the earth. And so basically the diameter of the earth is the unit, the basic unit. And then you have several bodies, uh, you have the planets, and you also have stars that were supposedly of different sizes according to their brightness, which is a conception that, of course, we know now that it's not correct, but that's not the point. This is a very powerful way of representing the different sizes of celestial bodies by showing their proportional relative sizes. It's Christian Huygens again, who apparently is among the first two uh, use the same kind of convention but now to convey the idea of the planets according to the Copernican system. So in his Cosmotheoros, which was published posthumously, and which is a work in which uh, Huygens very much speculates about the possibility of uh, life existing in the other planets, based on the, the principle that the other planets, again, must be pretty much like the Earth, they simply they are different in size and in appearance, but they must be the same thing, so they must have their own inhabitants. And of course, with developments in telescopes and in the growing use of the telescope as a measuring device, a better knowledge, sorry, a, a better knowledge of planetary diameters and the dimensions of the planets now allows Huygens to create this model in which he represents the sun, and then he can show the relative sizes of the planets as compared to that of the sun. And of course, you see here that the internal planets, Mars, the Earth, uh, um, Venus, and uh, Mercury, Venus, the Earth, and Mars are very, very small. But again, for uh, Huygens, it was essentially a matter of size and appearance, because he considered that all planets potentially could have their own inhabitants. The same kind of convention then uh, will appear in different types of publications, for example, in broadsides, which were popular publications that were aimed at varied audiences. Here we have uh, a broadside on the left, we have a broadside by William Whiston, a scheme of the solar system from uh, around 1720. And you see that this is meant to represent the arrangements of the orbits of the planets, also in there with their relative sizes. And then you see that superimposed to this illustration which also shows you the orbits of the comets you also have this diagram that again shows the re relative dimensions of the planets. Same thing here in this uh, illustration from 1763 uh, from the Netherlands. And some authors will add further visual uh, strategies to convey, further convey this idea of distances, of sizes, and importantly, to make the observer and the reader reposition herself or himself uh, in other worlds. So here in this, in this plate from astronomy explained upon Sir Isaac Newton's principles, uh, which was an extremely important book at plenty of editions throughout the 18th century, very important book in the popularization of the ideas of Newton. James Ferguson was himself a very keen popularizer uh, and maker of scientific instruments. And you see that here you have very much the same kind of conventions, showing the, relative, the relative dimensions of orbits, showing the different sizes of the planets in proportion uh, to each other. But here, this is a remarkable uh, 
addition. What you see here is basically the apparent size of the sun as seen from the different planets, beginning with from Mercury to, uh, basically goes from Mercury to uh, uh, Saturn. And this is remarkable because this is not just about showing different sizes uh, or showing different dimensions, but again, appealing to the observer and to the reader to go to a different location and imagine how things would be seen from a different locations. Here in this illustration from uh, a companion system of astronomy by Margaret Bryan, we see very much the same kind of conventions. And it's interesting to note that these visual strategies will appear throughout uh, a large number of public, different publications in which the image of the solar system itself, uh, it's changing. Notice here, for example, George and Sidus, which eventually was renamed as Uranus. So uh, this diagram already shows a new planet that has been added to the inventory uh, of the known planets. And the more things were discovered, and th during the first half of the 19th century, several asteroids were discovered, and they were generally considered as planets. At least, as long as you could still include them in the model of the solar system, you could still call them planets. By the mid-19th century, perhaps around 10 were known. By the late, by the end of the 19th century, 500 were known. And so eventually they had to be reclassified as a group of their own. But before of that, they were entitled to their own presence in diagrams of the solar system. And here you see again from Asa Smith, here you see a diagram showing the sizes of the planets, including the asteroids. And here a very interesting diagram which shows the relative inclinations of the orbits of uh, uh, the planets in the solar system. A very intricate image because it also includes uh, the asteroids. This was a period when uh, there was a growing market uh, and, and a growing demand for this kind of publications. There's a growing middle class, uh, there's a growing access to education, and of course, instrument makers and printers try to take advantage of these new market niches. Uh, this was also a period when the techniques of projection and the magic lantern uh, was widely used in public lectures and widely used to convey ideas about astronomy uh, to, and, and other fields to general audiences. Here we see a rather remarkable example of how these visual tricks to convey the different sizes of the planets uh, and, the different, and, and the distances and sizes of their orbits appears in a set of transparencies, which somehow the idea is that you would hold a transparency against the source of light, and, he, and this, the image here would gain vivid colors. So it was, in a sense, bringing the techniques of pro projection and uh, the, la uh, the, the, magic, the effect of the magic lantern to uh, a small group, a small audience, and maybe more even a domestic environment. This, this, this form of visual representation is very enduring, uh, we still use it nowadays everywhere in planetaria and in science museums all over the world. This is a gallery at the other planetarium. Uh, and here you have the planets of the solar system, solar system gallery, and we basically have the planets uh, at their relative sizes. Uh, and here you can see this is the, the top of one of our uh, theaters. And so that stands for the sun. And these are the relative sizes uh, of the planets. This is very much reminiscence. You'll see this kind of thing in science museums and planetaria all over the world. And this is very reminiscent of uh, the visual conventions and strategies that we just saw in those publications and illustrations. Now we always have the challenge that if you want to combine the scale of the planets with the actual scale of the orbits, in that case it helps if you use a whole city because the scale is so overwhelming that it's, you cannot really combine it efficiently uh, within a planetarium. So this is, again, this is a kind of, uh, of installation that you will also see uh, in, in different sites, science sites and science museums and planetaria all over the world. So we did, the other planetarium did this in 2015. Uh, and so the idea is that in order to apprehend the, uh, the, the scale of the solar system, we would have the sun basically at the door of the planetarium. And then we will have the orbits of the planets extending throughout the city. So it will be a 10 minute walk to Mars, which would be uh, right by the Field Museum and the Shedd Aquarium. But if you wanna reach Pluto, and of course we had to include Pluto not to hurt anyone's feelings, um, 
you would have to go almost to Evanston, to the very limits of the city. So here we have the superimposition of, uh, well, the scale of the solar system with the scale of the city, which is a kind of strategy used to basically create a sense of familiarity with all of these overwhelming scales. And I think the word familiarity, it's very important here. But still, I think nothing is compared. When we deal with scales and sizes, we're still dealing at a very geometrical and abstract uh, level. I think nothing is more compelling than natural, actually thinking of the planets as actual places. And I think this sense of place, it's pretty much what is, uh, underlies the, the space age, really, because you don't, you don't send spacecraft to moving dots in the sky. You send spacecraft to places uh, where you expect to find some kind of landscape, topography, features. Of course, the telescope gave faces and features to the planets. And I find this place from, the, from Alain Malé's Description de l'Univers from 1686 very striking because clearly he doesn't respect the scale and he presents the planets just against these bucolic landscapes. But I think the fact that he doesn't respect scale, he wants certainly to create a compelling visual effect. And, and I think there's some, there's some some kind of statement here that the planets have, are also part of our cosmic landscape in a sense. And they have their own features, their own landscapes, and their own spatiality as things here on Earth. Of course, we heard about how the moon and how the discoveries on the moon excited the, imagine, the early modern imagination and excited ideas about, again, repositioning the observers, the idea of traveling to the moon. The moon was, in fact, extremely important because it's the well, it's the closest celestial body that we could actually map early in the history of the telescope. So astronomers like Evelius, Evelius uh, and others in the 17th century produced the first atlases of the moon. Uh, in many cases, using, resorting to conventions that were used in terrestrial cartography and even trying to use the same kind of nomenclature, which eventually gave way to a nomenclature more based on the names of uh, astronomers and scientists connected to the moon, which of course is a sort of a self-reference pantheon for astronomers themselves. But the fact is that these moons really created this idea of an, a celestial body being, the celestial body becoming a cartographic object, becoming a natural place. And throughout, for example, the 19th century, even before photography entered into the picture, we have very detailed maps of the moons, such as this chart of the moon with 25 plates by Hilly Schmidt, which really gives a very strong topographic impression and image of the moon. But more than that, this is still a representation on a sheet of paper. Hilly Schmidt himself got involved in giving a sort of a volumetric existence uh, to the moon by becoming involved in the making of this moon globe. A very impressive moon globe that was made in Germany uh, under the coordination and the supervision of Juli Schmidt and which eventually uh, came to the United States in the 1890s and was put on display as shown in this photograph at what at, at, what at the time was called the Phil Columbian Museum. However, we know that there are newspaper articles. So before the, the globe was put on display at the Field Museum, uh, it was used as a kind of a traveling exhibit. And it seems that it was not very successful because people didn't really seem to engage with it, which is interesting. Could it be because it basically just presented them with a very barren moon, and that was the deception? I think, it tr I find it actually much, much more striking than this moon globe with its three-dimensionality is the idea of, again, the moon having its own landscapes, being its own place. Here we have an extremely interesting use of photography, not to photograph the moon itself, because when this book, The Moon Considered as a Planet, a World and a Satellite by James Nesmith and James Carpenter was published, uh, actually the first edition is from 1874, uh, photography was not still, astronomical photography was not developed enough to make a, a, an accurate mapping of the moon. But so Nesmith used, made plaster models of uh, lunar craters and what he imagined some lunar features to look like to create these really, really impressive and striking images that made us 
imagine, I think maybe the reader imagined uh, herself as being in the moon. Although Nasmith advised that it's probably not a very good place to be and not a very suitable place for life. But still, this idea of the moon of a landscape in another body, I think it's very striking. And nothing contributed as much to that, I guess, as the debates around the, the supposed canals of Mars. Here we see an image of Mars with its supposed canals from uh, 1908, the appearance of Mars in 1905 by Percival Lowell. As many of you know, Percival Lowell became fascinated with the idea that there could be canals on Mars. It was announced by an Italian astronomer called Giovanni Schiaparelli. He talked about canal in Italian. It was translated as canals, uh, and it conveyed the impression that perhaps those were artificial structures made by some kind of um, Martian civilization. So here we move from not only Mars becomes a, a, a cartographic object, but it becomes even almost like an arena space for infrastructure public works programs, which is quite impressive. And needless to say, what's happening in all of these images and ideas is very much a straightforward projection of things that are happening in Earth. All of this is happening in an age of empire, an age of great infrastructural projects, an age of extensive cartographic imperial projects. And so the Martian canals are very much a resonance in this, but they have a tremendous effect in public imagination, for example. Here we move from the map of the planet with, with, with its supposed canals, which was just basically uh, an effect of the brain trying to connect disparate features, and this was proved in the 1940s. There were no canals on Mars whatsoever, but Pandora's box had been open. So the imag public imagination will remain excited about Mars to this day. There's something, I guess, that connects Elon Musk uh, to uh, what was happening in this period, this fascination with Mars. And of course, uh, uh, space artists such as uh, Chesley Bonestell, uh, Lucien Rudeau too, but here in the United States, Chesley Bonestell, they played a very important role in further exciting the public imagination by depicting the planets, combining available scientific inf inf uh, information with um, well, a great leap of imagination. And of course, Bonestell, before becoming a, a full-time space artist, he had worked as a map painter in Hollywood. So he was well acquainted with the perspective and shadow, uh, and of course, used all of those techniques to create these very impressive and realistic planetary landscapes here on Mars. And here again, the idea of relocating the observer, Mars, as it would be seen from its larger satellite. And here, the famous painting Saturn as seen from Titan. And Chesley Bonestell went even further than the, the um, solar system, and he even invited us to position ourselves in other planets orbiting other stars, which is very impressive. Now, imagining, we've been talking essentially of the solar system, and now I, I, I move to the final uh, part of my talk. Uh, Imagine the solar system, uh, imagine this true scale, its true dimensions, and getting the sense of place was difficult enough, but more so was to imagine, to depict, and to represent the stellar heavens. Of course, that the debates and the rise of Copernicanism in the 17th century excited the imagination of several authors uh, and thinkers about the possibility of, or what was called the plurality of worlds, the idea of other stars, so if if the Earth is just a planet orbiting the Sun, it's possible that other stars have their own planetary systems, as shown in this theatrical frontispiece of uh, Fontenelle's uh, dialogues on the plurality of worlds. And here again, we see the same idea in this plate by Nicolas Bion, in this case meant to illustrate the, uh, the ideas of René Descartes and this idea that matter created vortices that kept things in motion. But interestingly, it's how, so we have a depiction of the solar system here, and then the solar system is just another star among other stars with their own planetary systems. Eventually, the ideas of Descartes are overthrown by Newton uh, and Newtonian mechanics. And in this very dramatic representation of the Newtonian universe, which interestingly, uh, was made by a man, Isaac Frost, who was part of the Muggletonian sect. So he wanted with this image to show this system is wrong and is not compatible with the Bible. However, 
He produced one of the historically most beautiful and striking representations of the Newtonian idea that stars are uh, uniformly distributed in space. Uh, and of course here, the element that maybe stars have their very own planetary systems. And note the colors which are very impressive. So this was a technique, an early printing technique developed by uh, George Blackster using different woodcuts uh, and colors producing this striking effect. But now even though these images convey uh, this idea of the immensity of the universe and the stellar universe, they don't really tell us much about but how are stars actually arranged in the sky? And more importantly, a question that was a vashing question and not that many people dare to address, at least up to the 18th century, what is that white swath that we see across the sky, the Milky Way? Of course, that Galileo and others knew when they, they pointed their telescopes, they knew that they were essentially stars, but why is there a concentration of stars in that direction? One of the first authors that not only speculates about the, the shape of the Milky Way, and the uh, but also of the distribution of stars, is Thomas Wright. Thomas Wright was a, um, essentially a teacher, so uh, he had many hats, so he was essentially a teacher, but he was also a surveyor, uh, and an architect uh, who had learned astronomy essentially by himself. And Thomas Wright's project uh, was not just to apprehend the structure of the Milky Way, but in fact his major concern was to combine the idea of a distribution of stars in the universe, say their order in the universe, with the moral and divine center of the order of things. So Wright essentially speculates about the structure and distribution of stars, but he has one correct intuition, which is that if we see so many stars, and this is basically what is meant is, uh, what this plate is meant to show. If you are here and if you look in a direction where most stars are concentrated, so uh, of course you will see a swath of stars uh, and a white swath in that direction in the sky. But now, what is the actual arrangement of stars and what's, in our, what's our place in it that produces this effect? Right place with different concepts. So one of the concepts he comes up with is that maybe the stars are arranged in a sort of a sphere, forming a kind of a hollow globe, and in the center of that globe, so here are the stars, and in the center of that globe is the very divine, the center of divine providence, and the moral and divine center of the universe. And if we are positioned here, if our sun is positioned somewhere around here, so again, when we look in the tangential direction uh, to the sphere of stars, we will see an effect like the Milky Way in the sky. Wright was not using obs observational evidence, so he's basically speculating, and, and he played with other possible arrangements as well. So here in the analogy of Saturn, he imagined how the stars could create the appearance to an observer on Earth uh, if they were distributed in rings around a center, which is here as the um, the appearance of the planet, but precisely just to emphasize this idea of a metaphor. And even though Wright was not very fond of the idea of multiple, multiple centers uh, in the universe, he also played with that hypothesis, and this is what this image actually shows you. And now, I would like to show you, to better help us visualize how this would work in space, I would like to show you a brief animation made by some of my colleagues at the Adler Planetarium, based on Wright. So this is an animation made by uh, my colleague Mark Subaral, who is the director of our Space Visualization Laboratory, and Juliette Aguilera is no longer with the Adler, but also worked in the Space Visualization Laboratory. So here we have uh, original Wright's illustration. So this is how the stars would look like, according to that model of his. Um, and now we will soon get into, precisely get into a tangential plan through the sphere of the stars and get this impression in space. But of course, again, these conceptions, which of course uh, don't really have, uh, um, don't really explain what we actually observe in the sky, had the merit of trying to bring and trying to materialize and to create a spatial thinking about the arrangements of stars in the universe. But, the connection between actual astronomical observation and the attempt to study the structure of the galaxy came with uh, William Herschel. So William Herschel, who is better known for his discovery of Uranus, his major project, one of his major projects in astronomy was to try to figure out the structure of the galaxy. 
and he carried out an extensive observing program using large telescopes that he made himself uh, and he used some sort of proto-statistics. So basically, he, he made several assumptions which now we know are not correct, but he basically assumed that he could see the borders of the galaxy. And so he began by pointing the telescope to different directions in the sky and by counting how many stars he could see in each direction. And so by using that data, uh, he established this first attempt of a model of the galaxy. And again, I can show you another animation. So basically what you, we have here, again, you have the Earth at the center, and you have most of the stars in the Milky Way concentrated along a single plan. And even though, of course, the actual model of the galaxy, as according to the astronomy of today, is much different, the basic intuition that the stars must be distributed along uh, the same plane was basically correct. And now I would like to, uh, I'd like to show you another animation. So here we have it again. So basically, again, the intuition that the stars are more or less distributed along the same plane. And of course, that the idea of a spiral galaxy comes much later. And I will actually end my talk with that in a few minutes. So here you have, so basically from the illustration made by Herschel, we turn that into at the actual distribution of stars. And here is the production of the effect of the Milky Way. So when you're looking precisely in the direction of the plane where most of the stars are concentrated. It was only in the 20th century, even though it's such a familiar image, it was only in the 20th century that uh, astronomers were finally able to prove that the shape of the galaxy, it's actually a, uh, a spiral shape. Uh, and what you see here is one of two models, actual models made by William Morgan, was at the Erkes Observatory. Uh, and so he basically, by studying the distribution of stars and uh, clouds of gas whose positions are represented by these tiny cotton spheres. Uh, it was already known that all stars in spiral galaxies um, tend to be concentrated at the center of the galaxy and then you have the younger stars, blue stars, and you have ionized gas in the outer arms of the galaxies. And so when Morgan and his collaborators tried to map some of clusters of young stars and, uh, and ionized gas, they found these positions. And what you see here, and this was presented uh, at the uh, meeting of the American Astronomical Society in 1951, uh, and Morgan got a standing ovation when he presented this very model that materialized uh, what, he had, uh, obs what, what he had derived from his data. Uh, so this is pretty much where the first time where you can see more or less the spiral shapes of the galaxy being uh, derived and being presented, which is now a very familiar uh, shape, so familiar that we even have it in our backyard in the, at the other planetarium. So what you see here uh, on the left is a model, uh, a, a sculpture inspired on the spiral shape of the galaxy by John David Mooney, here placed against the skyline of Chicago. And this is, a, this is kind of our own local stone engine in a sense. So we could call it the Adler Henge. So basically it's a monument, it's a sculpture with several stones with astronomical alignments, but again, based on the shape of the galaxy. So that pretty much that shape that was first derived using that model is now pretty much a very familiar image in astronomy to the point that it's even used in artistic installations uh, around planetaria. I like very much the fact that this sculpture is just by the lake, which serves in a sense as a reminder that our galaxy is actually just part of a much broader horizon. But by creating familiar shapes and familiar forms and by somehow making the heavens tangible, giving them dimensions, bringing them closer to us, superimposing the scale of the heavens with scales of things we are more familiar with, like the scale of a city, uh, and essentially trying to present them in a way that gives a sense of place, I think we make the heavens more familiar and apprehensible. And I would like to end by saying that, um, and going back to the story I told in the beginning about that lady was overwhelmed by the scale of the universe, I think imagining the extraordinary is essentially an attempt to make it ordinary, uh, apprehensible and familiar. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Pedro. Um, it is my true pleasure to welcome uh, Kimberly Noel Arcand, our next speaker and our last for the session, uh, to the stage. Kimberly is the visualization lead at NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory, which has its headquarters uh, at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Arcand is an award-winning producer and director, and she is a leading expert in studying the perception and comprehension of high energy data visualization across the novice expert spectrum. As a science data storyteller, she combines her background in molecular biology and computer science with her current work in the fields of astronomy and physics. Today, Kimberly will be talking about the intersection of data visualization and human choice, which is a sort of fascinating uh, topic. Um, on a personal note, it was with some timidity that I first approached Kimberly uh, for this symposium. Um, I was aware of her intimidating amount of publications, her work with NASA, uh, and her TED Talks, uh, but I imagined that she would have little interest in talking to a rare books curator uh, about her research. One can fake many things, but knowledge of physics and molecular biology was beyond my capability. Um, I was happily proven wrong, um, and Kimberly is, is here with us today. Uh, her enthusiasm and dedication to stories about science is truly inspiring, uh, and so I'm so pleased to welcome Kimberly to the stage. Thank you so much. I have an artifact, and I'm going to put it on display like a proper curator would. So I'm going to talk about things that are very big and also things that are very small. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I started out with this. This is Ixides scapularis. Um, it is essentially a deer tick, and inside its stomach are these little tiny spirochetes, these bacteria that when transmitted to humans can give us Lyme disease if the tick is attached to you for like 24 to 48 hours, but details. Point is, this is where I started out. This was kind of my introduction into science as an undergraduate. Um, but I quickly realized that I was actually more interested in the tools that I was using, the computer essentially, than I was interested in staring at the stomach of the deer tick 24 hours a day <laughs> under a microscope. Um, so I went and studied data visualization and image and meaning, and that actually landed me a job working for NASA's Chandra X Observatory. Now, I got this job when I was, let me see, it must have been 1998, so it's been almost 20 years. Um, the Chandra X Observatory was just about to launch, and it's an amazing technological achievement. Um, it studies the high energy universe, so things like exploding stars, black holes, colliding galaxies, these really violent cosmic events that we can study high energy information from. And it was great to be a part of that as it was launching. But again, this is where I was starting out. Um, this is actually an image of the spirochete inside that, that tick stomach. It's Borella burgdorferi. And this, each one of these little spiral things is about 10 to 25 micrometers long. So I had to translate that information that I was used to dealing with into looking at things like this instead. This is the antenna galaxies. It's a sort of spiral-shaped uh, collision of two galaxies. And this is 60,000 light years across, where a light year is the distance that light travels in a year, which is about 10 trillion kilometers. So 60,000 times 10 trillion kilometers. So it's a pretty big scale difference, <laughs> I think. Um, but really what I want to talk about today is this idea, and, and I'm so happy that the historians went before me because I'm not a historian. Um, so it's great that that language has already been introduced and I can just write on their coattails. Um, because I wanna talk about this idea of a visual language, which uh, both speakers earlier talked about briefly. And um, they also introduced Galileo's moon, which I will show too. Um, but I won't have to talk about it all because you're all experts, obviously, in Galileo's moon by now. 
So when we talk about how our images of the universe are really how any image in science is created, it's through a selection of choices. It's through a human using software that has been created by humans, um, using data that was collected by hardware that was made by humans. So there's these strings of choices and human uh, biases along the way. I'm gonna try to talk about some of that. So to make images like this, there's this visual language, um, scale, context, dimensionality, field of view, cropping, selection itself. These things are done to make a point, right? There's a science story to tell, but there's also this idea that you want your image to be memorable, to be persuasive. So we're gonna look at bugs, because <laughs> obviously I love bugs if I spent so much time looking at them. Um, these are from uh, Hooks Micrographia, who we also heard about from, I think, both, no, Gaskell mostly. Um, and we've got a couple examples here that I particularly like. One, I just think they're beautiful. These are really beautiful illustrations. Hook, I think, had a really amazing talent for being able to bring his objects, quote, to life. But he's also using very specific visual techniques to translate something that started out in three dimensions into a two-dimensional form. He's collapsing that information onto a version that works on the page. And he's carefully creating his images through, you guessed it, a series of choices. So in this case, Hook is really placing his instrument, a microscope typically, though he did also work with telescopes, as an extension of our senses. With this introduction of this new equipment in the 1600s, it, it offered that the observer could then function as a bridge, a bridge between an invisible world and then other interested parties who didn't necessarily have to do the observing themselves. That immediately gives you a sense of distance already as the third party viewer, um, not just of distance physically, but also in time. So, what kind of visual strategies did Hook use? Well, he used his space really well, isolation, composition, contrast, shading, dimensionality, all of these really important things that we use today, hundreds of years later in astronomy. So a really quick description of what it is we're looking at. On the left, we've got a lovely gnat, and this beautiful gnat has been zoomed in quite a bit so that you don't see all of its body. That's a very intentional framing. It's just enough so you can see the details of the wings, of the body on the bottom, of just the hairs on its legs, really lovely. On the right, we actually have the eye of a drone fly. I think it's a gray drone fly to be precise. And again, with this image, we're cropped in really, really tight. Hook is taking you to a very specific place, really guiding your eye on what to see and what's important. There's a really interesting perspective here on what he's choosing to do. So this sort of visual language then has to be essentially decoded, right? By the cropping, by the framing, he's giving you a very specific but also very dramatic um, and quite beautiful thing to look at. He was always one for drama. So how do we compare with astronomy? And I had a little fun here because both of these nebulas are named, nicknamed after bugs. So on the left, we have the ant nebula, because why not? Um, but you can see here, I've chose to crop in pretty tightly. This is using optical or visible data from the Hubble Space Telescope. And what a planetary nebula like this is, is essentially a sun-like star that is slowly dying. Uh, as they die, they puff off their outer layers and create these beautiful nebulas that you see here. Now, in both of these examples, they're really nice uh, with their symmetry, so I also picked that on purpose besides the fact that they are named after bugs. Um, and I've cropped in really tightly for a reason. So there is more data to see here, but I'm not allowing you to see it. The cropping is a very specific intent. You wanna see all of the action, all of the things that are going on as this sun-like star is throwing off its outer shell. And then, of course, on the right, uh, that one's called the Bug Nebula. It's also nicknamed the Butterfly Nebula, but I'm gonna use Bug since it's closer to the previous slide. And it's the same thing. It's the same type of planetary nebula, this beautiful death of a star. And we're cropped in so tight because right inside the center point of that bipolarization is the star itself that we can't see because in this case, we're using optical light and the optical light cannot get through that gas and dust. So again, very intentional. Now we're gonna look at rosemary and other leaves, not as exciting as a topic, but what I really liked is that the, the scope view 
provide a, a sort of secondhand experience that makes it feel more virtual, like you're actually there, you're actually looking through the microscope yourself. Of course, by doing this, you get to tighten really close again, you get to look at this texture, you get to look at how he's done the shading and the area that he selected of interest, but it's also, again, quite intentional. And in astronomy, we can do similar things. So here, I picked these images because, well, they're round, and I thought the symmetry was nice with the texture, but essentially we're looking at three examples of exploded stars. So these are stars larger than our sun that have, you guessed it, uh, died. And I'm not like really morbid, but it's just, this is, you know, the nature of the universe in some sense. So we're gonna be talking about a lot of dead stars today. Um, but again, what this really tight, close circular crop allows us to do is to see a lot of the detail. And also it's a practical thing because in all three examples of these supernova remnants, all the data was taken by the Chandrax Observatory. Um, outside of those frames, there's not really much to see. It's just kind of black space and a little bit of X-ray noise. So if you leave an entire frame like that around this important X-ray observation, it gives the sense to the viewer that there is nothing else around that object, and that's actually not true. It's just we can only see this in X-ray light. If we were to combine it with, say, an optical field or infrared, we would see yet more of the universe behind it. So by cropping in really closely to the objects, we're actually helping to view, um, to help guide the viewpoint that these are specific objects that we're just concentrating on right here. Now, not bugs, um, but looking at seeds, why I selected these images from Hooke's drawings was that I just thought the texture and the dimensionality were really exquisite. On the left, we have poppy seeds. So this magnification is really quite amazing. Uh, and on the right, we have seeds of time, I believe. Now you can see all the little modeling, the, the texturing, the ridging. You can see where his light is coming from because it's casting shadows. And that kind of dimensionality, again, makes it feel more real as if you're closer to the observation, to the information, to the data than you might be otherwise. In astronomy, dimensionality is incredibly important too. Now this image I just selected because it kind of looked like the seeds in a way. Um, but again, you're looking at individual galaxies that are many, many billions of light years away. A light year, the distance that light travels in a year, 10 you know, trillion kilometers. So these are billions upon billions. This is pretty much as far as we can see in astronomy today in the observable universe. And still, when we're taking our image, when we're creating them, we are trying to make sure that the idea of dimensionality is still there. But probably an even better example is this image, which is, I think, kind of famous. Um, it's from the Hubble Space Telescope. It's called the Pillars of Creation. And uh, it's also nicknamed uh, the Eagle Nebula and M16. Astronomy has a thing for names. We've got a lot of nicknames. Um, but these are really beautiful, tall columns of gas and dust where stars are being born. So there's, so there we go. It's all, all about death. Um, the column on the left is about four light years tall. Um, so four times 10 trillion kilometers. So it's quite a difference in scale four times 10 trillion kilometers versus the 400 times magnification that we looked at in the previous slide. But the way this image was created, again, was intentional. It was to talk about the science, and the science in this case is this idea of these immense pillars of gas and dust where these baby stars are being made. And to get across the point of the dimensionality, we well, the, the image processors on this specific data set, applied colors in a very strategic way to encourage that dimensionality to be immediately visible to the viewer. And that was purely by color selection. So I'll talk a little bit about more how we make astronomy images in a second, but essentially for this image, the colors were chosen by chemical elements by the light emission due to them. So red was, from sulfur and the blue color was assigned to hydrogen and helium and I think green was assigned to oxygen. So it's kind of like a, an elemental map of the stuff that's going on in this really beautiful nebula. By choosing those colors, now this is something we can't see with our human eyes, even though it's mostly optical light, our eyes are kind of puny in the grand scheme of things and we could never detect all of this information with just the eyes that we have. 
So these telescopes give us superhuman vision. So when we're working with our data, it doesn't particularly matter what colors these are because it's not something we could really observe directly. So the color assignment was meant to help further the idea that this has dimension and shape to it. And so with blue being more in the background and the reds being more in the foreground, that, that idea of dimensionality and shading I think was really made a lot stronger. When we think about things like scale, which is I think a really difficult thing to talk about when you're looking at something really, really small or when you're looking at something really, really big. One of the easiest techniques to do is to provide some sort of sense of scale through a physical representation. So on the left here, we have this really lovely louse, and I don't think that's probably <laughs> something I say very often, um, but it's grasping a single strand of hair. So that immediately gives you a sense of scale but also context because, well, let's face it, lice, they like hair. So it provides so much more than just a little, you know, something for it to hold on to. It gives you that immediate idea of scale and contextualization. On the right is essentially another idea of scale. The idea here that he was trying to show was that sometimes things that seem so smooth are really not. And the pollen grain looking like thing is actually a printed full stop, a period. And for scale, you can also see the needle point. And then underneath that is the razor. So it's this idea of, you know, known things and looking at them in a different way, but still providing a relationship to each other. Scale in astronomy is hard. <laughs> it's really hard. So our sun is kind of small. In the grand scheme of things, it's just an ordinary star. It's kind of on the smaller size. It's not super exciting. It's perfect for us, don't get me wrong. And I love our sun. I'm not, you know, downplaying it that much. Um, so when it comes to talking scale, well, you could fit maybe a million Earths inside our sun. So we can show the idea of scale by positioning that one single Earth in relation to this one outburst coming out of the sun. And that single outburst, which was not particularly big, dwarfs the Earth by quite a lot. Now, the issue is, as soon as you get beyond something that's mm, a little bit more doable in size, like the sun is, to bigger things, how do you portray the scale in a meaningful way to the viewer who might not necessarily have any sort of personal connection to sizes of these things, like none of us really do? Um, scale bars have been used for a while, as you can see. Hook used quite a lot of them in his Micrographia. Um, this is blue mold that's been magnified, I think, two or three hundred times. It's really lovely. Um, again, he's using the circular view, but this idea of the scale bar was really useful. We apply scale bars in astronomy as well. In this case, however, the scale is quite difficult. We are actually looking here at the El Gordo cluster of galaxies. This is the most massive distant cluster of galaxies we've ever been able to detect with a mass of about three quadrillion suns. This image is seven million light years across. Again, light year, 10 trillion kilometers. It's really huge. We provide a scale in Arcman, not super helpful. So typically when I'm talking about scale, I really do like to try to break it down at the very least into light years. But even light years, I think, are hard to really grasp um, the size of them. When we talk about how we represent these objects physically, I was always struck by this image from Micrographia, which is the flea. And if you've ever seen it in person, uh, it's like the size of a cat or maybe a small dog even, right? Which I think is kind of ironic because, you know, fleas like cats and dogs. So I don't know if that was intentional or not, but I've always thought it was really funny. Um, but it's this idea of the outsized. It adds such a sense of drama and spectacle um, for the viewer. And I think spectacle might perhaps be a little undersold as a technique. I really do appreciate the artistic merit that creating something like this um, took and what effect it has. In astronomy, it's difficult to go really big uh, because the objects are so huge. So we can 
show something on a wall. I guess you guys are looking at a pretty large version. That's kind of cool. Um, we can go, you know, a little bit more dimensional and big. And really, the only reason I chose this picture is because when I was looking through it, I, I saw that Her Majesty the Queen was in there. I thought we would maybe take a little quick stop for all the talking this morning and play a game. <laughs> what I thought we would do is look at a few modern images from microscopy because I didn't want it to be just historical. A lot of the things that I'll be talking about and have been talking about so far um, reflect on new just as much as the old. And so here I've actually gathered pairs of images from microscopy as well as astronomy just to showcase some of the unintentional similarities that are to be found in these things across such very, very different scales. So if we look at the Let's take the bottom right. Now, one of these is really big and one of these is really small. How many people think the one on the left of those two far right panels is the really big one of the pair? Just raise your hand. How many think that one's the big one? A couple. How many think the one on the very far right is the biggest of the pair? Oh, wow. All right. Must be the field that you're all in. You're correct. So the image on the far bottom right is a quasar 3C273, incredibly distant, billions of light years away, powered by this massive, super massive black hole at its center that is pumping out this ridiculous stream of high energy particles. It's gargantuan. And the image right next to it is, oh, wait, which one's that one? That one is not my image. It is membrane fission, so it's really small. But I was struck by how similar they look, just in a visual sense. Um, how about perhaps the images on the upper left? There are two red-like images. Who thinks the one on the left is the biggest of the pair? Raise your hand. Just want to see. Yeah. And who thinks the one on the right is the bigger of the pair? Oh, wow, so this one was much more split. So the image on the left is actually stars dying, because that's my favorite, in the small Magellanic Cloud, which is a really small satellite mini galaxy, not too far away from us, but still it's like, I don't know, 100,000 layers away. Um, and then the image on its right is Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And when you look at these images up close, I don't know how great your view is, um, the visual resemblance between the two is really quite striking. So the fact that we were able to look at this from a microscope for the one on the right and through a telescope for the one on the left is absolutely incredible. I'll just do the other pairs really quickly for people who want to finish the game on their own. Um, pair two is the sun compared with Raji cells, and those uh, Raji cells can lead to Epstein-Barr syndrome. Pair three onion cells and another dead star, my favorite. So that's the ones here on the bottom left. Pair four is rabbit tongue cells compared to Jupiter. So that's the upper right. And the one underneath it is a comparison between Mercury, our planet, and embryonic stem cells. Now I think, you know, a lot of you got the answers right, not that, you know, it's a quiz, but I, I think it is, there are visual cues that you can follow, uh, resolution and, and scale and structure. But I just thought it was really interesting to see so many similarities. So when I'm talking about that visual language, it still applies to modern microscopy images as well as astronomical images. So I'm just going to do a little brief skew into what I do all day. So this is an image of our sun, and it's actually showing the many different kinds of light that our sun emits. Um, one of the really important tools in astronomy is the fact that there is this entire multi-wavelength um, spectrum of information in order to, to understand things in the universe. And we really need to understand many different kinds of light in order to grasp the objects that we're looking at. This is one of my favorite objects in the entire universe, and I get to say that um, because essentially it's the first object that the telescope that I work for ever looked at. It's Cassiopeia A, uh, which is a star that exploded. Yes, I know. It's a supernova remnant. It is about 10, 11,000 light years away, so 10,000 times 10 trillion kilometers. And we're looking at it um, with data from the Hubble Space Telescope, quite beautiful, showing this uh, 10 million degree filamentary structure. 
we look at that exact same field of view that I've selected um, from Chandra's X-ray observatory, and we get a completely different view of the same patch of sky. So utilizing different kinds of light is really important for us. If we composite the two images together, we get a better sense of what's going on. Because as we noticed from the exercise earlier, sometimes if you're looking at an image like that, if you don't have some sort of recognizable sense or the fact that you know there's an astronomy person in front of you talking about it, you might not be aware that it is actually an image of a universal scale versus something small. But images of the universe, they start out looking a little bit more like this or maybe like that, but really it's this. So these images start out in this digital way. Um, we create them. We, you know, these are not giant cosmic selfies. Um, we have to create them from the stream of ones and zeros. And the way we do that is we have the object in the sky quite far away, Cassiopeia A in this example, 10,000 light years. That light has been traveling for a while. It um, is recorded by the spacecraft, and this is the Chandrax Observatory. And then that information is bundled up in the form of ones and zeros and sent down to my laptop wherever that might be. We then get to turn it into a table, which is very exciting. This table essentially records um, the distance, or the, the location of X and Y, um, the amount of energy, uh, how long it was observed. Uh, very fascinating to look at, I know. But then we use more software, and then we finally get a visual representation of the object. So we have quite a few steps before it gets to here. And this is pretty far along already. Um, I've scaled it, removed artifacts, um, perhaps composited a couple observations together to get a deeper data set. And then the final step is color. Typically, we use, again, the science to tell the story. We have a perspective. We are trying to get something across. And in this case, the way we cut up the colors and the energy cuts, you can see the blue was assigned to the highest energy x-rays, the green to the medium x-rays, and the red to the lowest energy x-rays to create what we call a chromatic ordering. Now, it's like a weather map on weather.com or the nightly news. Um, the point is to help fit more information, to add to the information quotient of this image. It's important to see where that high energy x-ray material is, for example. As you can probably tell, it's along the rim. And that's essentially the expanding shock wave going out into space. So we've colored it this way here, but we could color a different way for a different purpose. For example, we put out a release not that long ago that had this image color coded by chemical element, um, so similar to the one I talked about earlier. And the whole point of that image was to show that uh, essentially, the elements that we have inside of us come from the originate, the original originals from stars like this when they explode. So we have this data. We don't have to look at it just in 2D. We can look at it in 2D over time. This is looking at versions of the data from 2000, 2002, 2004, and 2007. And we can see that this observation is changing and that this image is expanding. And what we learned from this is that that outer shock wave that I mentioned a minute ago is traveling at around 11 million miles per hour. So adding time to our data, again, adds more to that information quotient. But we wanted to do more, so we worked with a scientist, Tracy Delaney, to figure out how to create a 3D map of this data. We included optical and infrared data to get a stronger picture. And mapped it by using the Doppler effect, by um, a simple assumption of the geometry that it was radiating out from a specific point, um, and also by borrowing brain imaging software from a local Boston hospital, because we didn't have our own 3D software at the time. So again, big, small, who knows? Um, but this image is the first time we were ever able to see a data-driven map of our friend Cassiopeia A, this exploded star 10,000 light years away, 10,000 times 10 trillion kilometers, and we're seeing it in three dimensions. Now, it does not look very recognizable in that form, so we took a wireframe of that data and we brought it into a 3D software package so that we could apply colors and textures that looked a little bit more like this thing might look, um, that made it look a little bit more astronomical to help give it that visual contextualization. 
And so it's data-driven in this sense, but it's a step removed from the last version, which is a step removed from the version before that, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the first time we're ever able to see through, below, above, behind a star that exploded 10,000 light years away, 10,000 times 10 trillion kilometers. But it was created by data. Uh, we weren't quite done. We thought, wouldn't it be fun to hold this thing? <laughs> Yes, we did. So we worked with our friends from the Smithsonian. I don't know if they're here, um, but we figured out how to 3D model, 3D print this 3D model. And we finally, just last week, figured out how to add color to our 3D model. So now we can hold a dead star in our hand and we can understand, in this case, the various chemical elements. So where the sulfur is coming from, I think that was the red in this version, where the silicon is coming from, where is the iron. And the only thing I'll notice just for posterity is that I had to leave the jets at home because they're so fragile and I was on an early flight this morning, I just didn't want to deal. So just pretend there are a couple of jets sticking out of that. Um, but yeah, so this is the first time we could hold a dead star in our hands, again hugely scaled down. This is about 40 million billion times the area of our sun and eight planets. You could toss in Pluto, it wouldn't make a difference, but it's really big, right? And it's dynamic, as I mentioned before, it's changing over time. So you're seeing it, you know, small in plastic. So take that for what it will. It's another representation. Um, but we weren't done yet, let's see. I think this is the only video that does not play automatically. Here we go. I thought, wouldn't it be fun if we could walk inside this dead star? So we took it to Brown University and some fantastic collaborators there. Uh, we were able to create a virtual reality version of that same data. And now you can see this is um, one of my students. She's walking inside a dead star. The camera person is outside the star, which is why it looks like she's not in it, but she's in it, trust me. So she's walking around inside a dead star. Cassie PA, 10,000 light years away, and she's inside it. And this is data. This is data representations. So we've created many different versions of this one famous supernova remnant. And I think as I think Roger mentioned this point, um, very collaborative. This is not me doing this. This is not one person doing this. This is just teams upon teams of people um, working to create different versions of their data for very specific reasons but it all started here. All of these data versions came out of this original bit of code. So, really quick, I thought it'd be useful to do a little case study, I guess, um, of images over time. And it was this whole idea of the image's truth that I thought would be really interesting. Um, I, I think there's this idea that modern photography uh, has removed the objectivity of these things, um, or the subjectivity, I should say, and that they are more truthful now. Well, perhaps, but when we look at this image from Galileo of the moon, we already heard there's an issue with it, right? So this is not, quote, accurate representation. He was creating this version for his own purposes, and it's really lovely. We can look at this version, which is a daguerreotype, um, and that's essentially a process that was kind of like a precursor to modern photography that uses a combination of chemical agents essentially to create something that looks very photographic. This is the oldest surviving daguerreotype of the moon, by the way. I think it was from um, John Whipple. And then we can see the moon from the Apollo missions. And this was as Apollo 11 was on their way back home. And I think this was maybe 10,000 nautical miles away. And it was one of them snapped a photo. And we have this version of the moon. Is that more real than this one? Or this one? Perhaps. Is it more truthful? Perhaps. Then we have this version. This is using a special nine millimeter telescope, super top of the line. The uh, astrophotographer slash astrophysicist, uh, who's a friend of mine who's working on this, Travis Rector, got this great deep data set. It's this incredible high resolution that we're able to see the moon in. Um, but he wanted to put it in the perspective of its cosmic background. So he grabbed a shot from a different telescope of the exact placement of the moon from the stars behind it. So this is a composite 
of the two images together. You can't physically take these two images as one um, just because of the brightness and the resolution issues. So is this one more truthful? Is this one more real? And because, you know, I'm paid by NASA's Chandrax Observatory. This is a version from the Chandrax Observatory. The x-rays are shown in blue and mapped over uh, an optical image of the same phase. And here, it was really useful for us to understand where x-rays from the moon were coming from. And they are essentially a reflection of the solar x-rays. Um, but we understood that fluorescence was happening here, and it helped resolve a mystery that had been around for decades. So it was cool. Is this one more truthful? So my last little mini story that I want to tell, as I'm sure everybody's getting a little antsy, um, is just that it's one thing to talk about how people like me or teams of me's create images like this, but when we talk about who we're creating them from, that's a whole other thing together. You know, you can have as much data in an archive as you want, um, but that has potential value. Um, data that's been visualized for a specific point, but for a specific audience has even more added value to it. So we started a research project called Aesthetics and Astronomy. Um, it's me and a couple other folks, um, imaging psychologist, aesthetics types. And we were able to understand how experts and non-experts approach images of our universe quite differently. Um, in this case, we're looking at the bullet cluster of galaxies. It's this really tremendous um, image about where the separation of normal matter and dark matter occurs. And it's actually a visual representation of that process happening, which we'd never been able to see before. Um, the normal matter is in pink, and this dark matter, of which there's an awful lot of it in the universe that we know very little about, is shown in blue. And when an astronomer looks at this image, they immediately want to know what telescopes were involved, so what's the science, what's the interesting you know, observational thing going on here. When a non-expert looks at the same image, it's, wow, that's beautiful first. Then eventually they want to know things like, well, what is it? Um, what does the scientist see when he or she looks at something like this? The expert, after formulating those first questions, slowly drifts into, wow, that's beautiful, or maybe you might get a, that's cool, if they're you know, a little more on the down low. Um, but so that idea of wonder is immediate for a non-expert and secondary for an expert. Color, incredibly important. As I mentioned, we're looking at something we can't see with our sad, puny human eyes, right? So does it matter what colors I choose? if it doesn't really have anything to do with a science story. In this case, we're looking at a galaxy, NGC 4696. I think it's about 50 million light years away, relatively close in the grand scheme of things. There is this supermassive black hole inside that white core that's spewing out these high energy particles and causing all of this material that you're looking at to be superheated. This was the way the image looked at first. Main difference between those two the X-ray is colored blue in this version and colored red in this version. Now, this image was meant to be for a non-expert audience. We were trying to talk about the heat in this galaxy. So which version should we have released to the public? Who likes the red version? Raise your hands. Yeah, who likes the blue? All right, you're a physicist, aren't you? <laughs> so physicists like this version because in physics, blue is hot, but the rest of us non-physicists, who says to their kid, don't touch that stove, it's blue hot? <laughs> Maybe you do, but I don't. So the whole point is color has a very specific cultural context, a very specific power to it. And if you're trying to get a point across red versus blue, it doesn't matter for the data. The data does not care. But it does matter for who's looking at it. Scale, I know I already talked about this briefly. What I'm just bringing up very quickly is that, again, scale is hard in astronomy to do in a really well way. But people at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, they typically spend about 17 seconds when standing in front of a masterpiece. Define masterpiece how you will. People looking at astronomical images on a screen, just about the same amount of time, that 17 second mark. However, you add a scale bar, and it could have very minimal text, just something like this doubles that, that viewing time, because it gives them something to think about. Now, why am I showing this picture? <laughs> so this is one of my favorite stories um, by a, an artist that 
I just love his taste. Um, this is Madame Henri Francois Raisonnet. I don't speak French, so excuse my pronunciation, by the artist Eugène Delacroix, uh, 1835. Now, I'm not an artist or an art expert or historian. If I were in a gallery at the Smithsonian and there were tons of pictures to look at, I wouldn't know to look at this one specifically. But um, this woman was the artist's aunt. And is really, you can see, kind of like this frank tenderness, I think, in the portrait. But I just want to read this one little bit. She was known for her beauty. Some 30 years before the date of this portrait, she served as a lady-in-waiting to Empress Josephine, and having caught Napoleon's eye, engaged in a brief liaison with him. After she died, Delacroix wrote to his friend, Georges Sand, each of the beings necessary to our existence who disappears takes away with him a whole world of feelings that no other relationship can revive. My husband's here. I hope he would write something like that about me after I'm gone, because that's a pretty powerful letter, right? But that immediately makes this piece so much more interesting. Now that I know the story, I would stop. It's a similar situation in astronomy, right? We, we see that this is beautiful, and now I can kind of see something in there that I didn't see before. But if we're just looking at a picture, such as Saturn in ultraviolet light, it's great, it has scientific purpose, absolutely. But if we're trying to communicate something interesting about it, the one thing that typically gets people is that, it, I don't know if you can see it on the screen. Let me see if I can, oh, yeah, there it is. See that little dot? That's Earth waving back at the Cassini mission that took this image. So we are in the context of this image taken very far away from us and in a different kind of light. But that idea that we can add to the story, I think is really helpful. And we've found that when we add really important, um, useful, relevant, interesting descriptions to our images, um, we increase the viewing time dramatically. Not just the amount of time it takes them to read the text, um, but also in just how much people will ponder it. But beyond just the viewing time, the aesthetic appreciation for this image improved dramatically when we had the contextual information presented with it than when it was presented just on its own. So there is a time for spectacle, and then there is a time for context. So I'm pretty much done. I'll just say I write books about this stuff because I'm so fascinated about it. I'm really happy to be here today to learn from everybody else and see what everybody else is doing. But essentially, you know, these images of our universe are not just cosmic selfies, we create them, we have a viewpoint, we are people, we have our biases, um, we should be more transparent with how we do them and why. We try very hard to be, for the telescope that I work for, um, using descriptions and having features on how we made things and breaking down the image into various pieces. Um, but I just want to end with this quote. By means of telescopes, there is nothing so far distant but may be represented to our view, and by the help of microscopes, there is nothing so small as to escape our inquiry. Hence, there is a new visible world discovered to the understanding. That is Robert Hooke from Micrographia. I leave some websites. If you want to see how you did on the quiz, you can go to chater.sidu slash micro. If you want to learn more about the research, go to the last one on the list, and then the other ones are probably more obvious. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.